doesn't matter if it recalls a little bit later. Um, welcome, very welcome to the last um, of our lectures in this semester, Gegenwarts Architektur. I think I saw a lot of you in Sprechstunde today, so we can be rather quick. I would like to recapitulate um, very briefly the exercise um, as an exam, which is going to be due by January 22nd. <coughs> The idea is to articulate an object which is very ordinary in a way that makes it interesting um, as an architectonic object. So it's, it's the table this time. All we want to give us a specific framing for your task are formal, so a strict amount of words between 500 and 1000 either English or German. And then what is important um, to be very precise with genres, styles, registers, titles that you use. So we want you to articulate a table in a way that positions it in a space. So that means it's not so much our interest to hear what you, how you define a table to a third person, like in a didactic situation. And it's not so much uh, the interest of following or getting into your head and following like an inner monologue, but your, 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 your genuine, your authentic ideas are. These are all very important parts, but we want you to dramatize them. No? So we want you to speak and write about the table in a situation that is not a didactical situation where the text describes um, in a mediating way how the object is to be understood. The object should be what it is when you wrote the text. So the, the, that is why all the formal aspects of writing, like which voice, which narrative voice are you choosing? Are you choosing one or several? Um, are you creating tensions of expectations which you then frustrate, or which you serve, or which you refine. All these kinds of, of aspects are important and you can work them out through choosing very, very carefully which words and in what way that you use when you craft sentences. So as a training you can try to read the texts that we have in the booklet. Um, so not all of them are equally well done in, in this regard. But they are all trying and showing you <coughs> different ways of how it can be done. So you can, it's about getting the gesture, no? getting a big spectrum of gestures of how such a task can be done. And then it's for you to choose one and to try to do it as good as you can. So it's an exercise in sophistication, much more than a text which will answer to the question, what is a table in any definitory kind of way. There will be three um, main aspects. So if you take this task serious, that means if you write one of these texts in careful language, you will not fail. So that's for granted. So we don't want you to fail with a, with a demanding and a creative task like this. But you can get a good grade um, if you focus a lot on the quality. So less about having the right idea of how to speak of a table, but of making an idea graspable. No? So the quality of how you do that. So this is the second point. So this has a lot to do with a precise use of grammar, of vocabulary, of dramatic tension, of articulation. And then what we also need for you to do is to put it in a plain, nice layout as a digital PDF. Please don't send us handwritten text. Please write them um, on a typewriter or computer. And don't forget things like your uh, matricle number. No? So, so this would be a, a pity if we have to do research to find this out. So, so this kind, so the, the presentation is not very complicated. We don't give you any layout recommendation. It just means put everything that is necessary to identify and read your text in a, in a, in a comfortable kind of way. 
with regard to how to, I hope that um, the lectures throughout the semester, basically, as well as um, especially also the one that we are going to have tonight and the texts that you have in your book, give you a kind of a spectrum of how such a gesture that allows you to take a stance um, can, be, can be trained, can be recognized, can be, can be uh, appropriated, can be refined, can be experimented with. So part of the challenge of this task is that you are very much in an open space of how to do so. So that is not really right or wrong. Just choose one way and try to give it a form that is carefully crafted. That's the most important. For the lecture today, we had um, we recommended for you to read a text by Oswald Matthias Ungers on metaphors, morphology. And in many ways, at least that's how I tried to work out the brief introduction to the text. This resonates a lot with what we want to do with our table texts. Um, the text also shows something which is unavoidable, but quite difficult. And that is translation between languages. So those of you who can read English and German, it's a good exercise to compare the two versions. Um, so Ungers wrote in German, and his title is Entwerfen und Denken in Vorstellungen, Metaphern und Analogien. And with this term, <coughs> Vorstellungen, that's the one especially that I want to foreground in this brief, in this brief slides in the beginning. There is not really an English translation. Yeah? <laughs> so, eine Vorstellung, it's not exactly the same like an imagination. It's not exactly the same like an idea. It's not the same like ideation either. So the translators of the text choose different versions in how they translate whenever Unger speaks of Vorstellung. And to trace how they do that is quite informative. So there is one passage we will see where he translates it as perception, for example. Here, it's translated as images. Um, so if there, is not a sim if there is not really a word for it in English, it makes it even harder to describe <laughs> what it is saying than in German. Um, <clears throat> we will try to get a bit closer to that by looking at some of the, uh, of the formulations we find in Unger's text and also by looking at what he really does with these with these images. Now, the main part of the text is, um, is images. So, <clears throat> the first thing to get there is that there is a way in which we can take a metaphor almost like a mechanic would look at an instrument. No? What a metaphor literally means, that means, literally always means according to a kind of an etymological ethnography. No, so, uh, with etymology, it's always tricky because where do you start? So, what is the original meaning of it? So, that is really hard to reconstruct. But what we can get is a spectrum of connotations that have crystallized over time and that have remained important. With regard to metaphor, it is very much that it's a word that denotes a transfer. So, it has to do with carrying something over to somewhere else. So, a metaphor is something like a vehicle or a pot, so something like that. Analogy, on the other hand, is not exactly the same like a metaphor. No? Analogy comes from um, analogia, very close to proportion. No? Ana means upon, according to, and logos, it's a ratio. But what does that mean? According to a ratio, does that mean that there are several ratios? Now, how can there be a relation between two ratios? And that is exactly what a proportion means. No? So if you think of it, I think it's on one of the next slides, we will come, we will come to it. It is so interesting because 
<laughs> how to think about another become in a way decorative. So then, um, I don't want to answer how to think about this, I just want to open it as a spectrum. If we have such an, an idea that there is a kind of a pure form, a pure logos, a pure ratio, then something like morphology, so that would mean you know, a kind of a logos that describes how form evolves, how form changes, how form in some real context, no? so morphology in, in, a, in a real context of, of, uh, of, of uh, things that take place, a, a complex situation, how they evolve, how they, are there rules to how it behaves? No? So morphology, for me the two most important contexts where I know, where I know it as a, as a theme is, um, is language of course, the morphology of the words, so to study how words uh, become meaningful, so it's prefixes, it's suffixes, it's not the endings, it's, it's how you build words, so these kinds of things. And then of course in biology as well with regards to, to organisms and to entities. And um, I think it's very interesting that especially in the 20th century of course morphology became a very very big interest in architecture as well. So form to look at form as if in a kind of an organic context that means exactly in a different kind of world than that pure abstract mathematical space that we associate with a ratio or a logos that would be timeless. No? So <clears throat> Ungers in this text is very much interested in both of these ideas. Mm. He writes the visionary process, and this again is, an, is a reformulation of Vorstellung. No? So Vorstellung as a, a visionary process whose data are based on imagination, another notion of Vorstellung, starts out with an idea, looking at an object in the most general way to find an image from which to descend to more specific properties. So that's how he puts it. So there are somehow images which are more comprehensive than other images. And the question is, of course, how to get at those images. So, <clears throat> to look at the form of analogy and proportion again. So, what we call a ratio is usually something in relation to something else. No? So, it's one half of a proportion. So a ratio, here it would be n to m, another ratio would be l to k. These are ratios. The proportion is if you say there is an equivalent relation between ratios. No? An analogy is interesting to think and there is a huge amount of discourse precisely about that question. Is analogy something else than proportion, or is it just another word for the same kind of thing? But if you go into writing, you see that um, you, can, you, can, you can add ratios, for example. No? You, can, you can add metaphors, you can embed them, you can make more or less complex ones. So you have a kind of an arithmetics that is not properly that which is embodied in in a proportion. So the level of numbers and the level of words, they're not exactly equivalent. And I think <clears throat> what is peculiarly interesting with regard to Ungers is that he exactly tries to investigate as a kind of a method how he how one does not have to decide either am I in this formal um, uh, uh, purely quantitative domain, or am I in a purely metaphoric, poetic kind of language? So it's about how can poetics and rationality, how can they play together? And what his images, as we will see in a moment, perform quite well, is that what he calls a Vorstellung 
is something like a larger hole in which two ratios could coexist, but neither one of them is represented as this hole. So he calls it, that's another citation from the text, as the meaning of a whole sentence is different from the meaning of the sum of single words, so is the creative vision and ability to grasp the characteristic unity of a set of facts, and not just to analyze them as something which is put together by single parts. And this characteristic unity is important to relate to what he tries to grasp as Vorstellung. Um, in a pure kind of Logos world, in a pure kind of quantitative world, you would have nothing characteristic, right? <laughs> because it's pure. So pure means hey, there is one character. There are not different characteristics. So he is clearly interested, and I think that's why it's a metaphorics of city and city form. He's interested in, a, in form in reality, so in a morphology. If you look now at some of these images that he collects, what we see, no, so how do we describe what we see here? Uh, we see a plan, we see a piano, but he gives us keys of how to read this as an analogy. He says, and I always depart from the German version because he is, I think, very much native uh, German speaking. Here he says the theme which can accommodate both of these images as an analogy is alternation. So there are a lot of things we could see in these images in terms of how they are like. But what he's interested in is the key alternation. So alternation is an index to a Vorstellung, <laughs> which we are all supposed to make by looking at the two images with regards to this. So that means he is evoking an idea which neither he precisely has, nor does he expect that his reader has them. It's a kind of a performative process. No? Other images here, the key that he gives us is Begegnung. I don't know whether you can see, I think these are two hands. So, what is interesting is that these images, they never, so sometimes like here we could say, well, it's a kind of an illustration, the image is a kind of an illustration, no, it's almost iconic, so we have touching hands. But then that would be very hard to recognize in the, in the city plan that he finds, so it must be more abstract than such a kind of an illustration. What we find here is similar, no, he calls it Entfaltung. Entfaltung, eh? yes, Entfaltung. So it needs a lot of projective transfer to think of these two images as an analogy. Hmm? And what he does is give us a guide in which direction, in which kind of Vorstellung he wants to direct the people who think together with him about morphologies of city like this. Here is another example. Here the term is Rückgrat. There are many ways, many affective ways. So what is interesting about all the keys, all the indexes that he gives to these images, that they are, very often they are verbs, very often they are substantivized verbs, like Entfaltung, or Begegnung, or Alteration. But they all trigger a kind of an affectivity. And they trigger a kind of a, a way of being moved by an image. So not precisely one that can be put in numbers or in words directly. It's a kind of an affective response that these words trigger. Similar here, these are both images for, in German, Verästelung. So in English this would be ramification. Now, usually when we speak of Verästelung, of course we draw 
a tree with the branches or we throw some kind of, of, uh, of growth. He gets a completely different affectivity with regard to Ferestelum by putting these two. So what I'm trying to say is that we can read and interpret these images as a method, as, which is what he, he proposes it as, to develop Vorstellungen. No? And the Vorstellungen as well, they are not true or false. We will come in a moment to what he calls them. Yeah, it's one more. Yeah. Here it's Abschirmung. Yeah, now sometimes it's very, very direct, no? like the turtle with the Abschirmung. Or there's an image with the, the eagle, but I don't know what the eagle is. The eagle, is, no, the hedgehog, exactly, in, in English, no? who's um, rolling up and uh, protecting itself. So these are all images that um, yeah, are quite strong in the affect that they transport. It's a kind of a sensibility, a kind of an, an emotionality, let's say, but not one that would be subjective. It's, no, it's not a certain person's kind of protecting themselves. It's a kind of a, 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 almost a pure, uh, not pure, <laughs> but a general form for a certain affectivity. So, <clears throat> in this book, what we always have is two words that give us a spectrum. We have two images. We are told to look at those in terms of analogies. And the interest behind this is to trace something like rules of how forms evolve or behave or emerge. What this is all about is a kind of, let's say, theorization that does not, that does not, um, is not geared towards saying um, what the best definition is, or what a good judgment is, or what, um, what is right or what is wrong, uh, or what is common sense established versus what is rather peculiar or unordinary. So it's a kind. It can be. It can be. It can be perceived. It can be used as a kind of a, an exercise in sophistication in terms of. But in German, I'm not sure how this is to be put in English. In German, I would call it Stumpfsinn. No, it's, it's one of these words which I don't know. It's ever really English. English, you know, so it's when your senses are rather no dull. No, so so they're not. They're not. They're not. Um, they're not refined. They're not sophisticated. They're not developed. It's a bit like. No, when you start to drink wine, you don't have that many distinctions for wine. <laughs> it's a very, people don't, so it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of an elitarian example. We don't need to go there. It's with olives, it's with cheese, it's with bread, it's with actually anything that you like. In the beginning, and the spectrum is not very broad, but as you live with it, it gets differentiated. So, and to not be differentiated, this is what in German we call Stumpfsinn. And that is a kind of a rationality because it can be objectified, it can be measured, it can be described, that is one that is always already also qualitative. And I think this is um, very much along the lines of how we can, we can, um, we can read uh, this, this idea to a, to a method. So he has one passage which I think supports this in a certain way. He describes, so it's the end, and probably all of us remember the story of the man in the moon, which, which occupied our childhood fantasies, producing all sorts of images of an old man carrying a bundle on his back and whose face used to change depending on the clarity of the night. He helped to fulfill secret wishes and so on. It's a kind of a, of a children's memory, of a child story, but what it beautifully illustrates is that there is something about Vorstellung that isn't precisely familiar. So a, a Vorstellung very often is not something that we could describe exactly. No, it's more something that we learn to live in, to live with. It gives a kind of a, of a support and an orientation, even though it's completely made up, it's completely fictional. No? And I wouldn't go so far now as to say most of the abstract concepts like form, <laughs> or number, or quality, or color, are exactly like this kind of Vorstellung. But when we see at how 
the knowledge with regard to any of these gets more refined, gets more differentiated, gets more powerful, gets more articulated. Um, the more many people use it. Then there is something about this idea which I find very attractive. And it is certainly a lot related to the topic of this semester's course, with these paradoxes or these, uh, these, these, ab these absurdities, like the very many and so on. So Vorstellungen, to develop eine Vorstellung doesn't necessarily, and I would even suggest it cannot mean that you understand what you are talking about or what you are exactly looking for. So there is something, and I was always very impressed, it's something we don't do in school anymore very much, but my grandmother, she had to learn poems by heart. <laughs> so not just a few lines, but really <laughs> quite a lot of poems. And I was, I remember at school, I was uh, making fun of that as well. And we are I'm so happy, we are so modern, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> but there is something about learning things without grasping what they mean or what they are as a kind of a Vorstellung in which you can, you can grow into no? and you can accommodate with it. And it helps you to refine senses and so on. So... <clears throat> What he is saying, and that is something that I find um, very, very interesting in a, in, a, yeah, it, it's a, in a different kind of, of field of time today. No, just very briefly, maybe we can in the next semester make a topic out of that. So to, how to think about data? Because data is a profoundly different way to relate to time and to temporality. Data means literally something which is given. But how is it given? It's only given because something does record it. So what is this recording? Is it a kind of a sensing? And if it is a kind of a sensing, is there something like Vorstellung that would make it sharper or duller? <laughs> so, so, so what is this spectrum when we are talking about data and the treatment of data? This pretty much summarizes, I hope, what I try to say. I'll skip it. I will put it, as always, online. You can have a look. This is a recommendation I would like to make to you. We don't have time to look at it. But it is a very beautiful lecture by um, a philosopher who is unfortunately not alive anymore, but still quite contemporary, Gilles Deleuze. It's a lecture on the creative act, and its idea basically is about ideas. Now, what, what does it mean to have an idea? Who are you when you have an idea? Are you you? <laughs> or are you not you? If you're not you, who are you? Is it a collective? Is it a common sense? Is it, what is this? What, what is happening when we have what we usually say, an idea? How to think about that? It's a very beautiful lecture, it's towards the end of his life, it's about 45 minutes. Here I have a link with English subtitles, and it's um, very much worth to look into. And now, as a preparation, I think, for the next lecture, we will be dealing a lot with kind of alien, machinic perception, robotic perception, question of morphology, and then, of course, anthropomorphism, because if we develop such Vorstellungen in order to regard data and stories, of course, they are rendered somehow in relation to what we regard as relevant for a human reality. So are there limits to that? Or is that a good thing? Or is that a bad thing? These are all topics that interest us with regard to um, learning to see how architects deal with computers, basically. And with that, I would like to give to Emmanuel, who will introduce our guest. Thank you. I think to Edouard's work also. Um, so 
uh, yeah, I think much has been said that you can elaborate upon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I will not risk myself in the, in the adding anything uh, aside from a proper presentation of uh, our guest lecturer tonight, who is Edouard Cabet. And uh, I think I've stressed every time the European dimension of our lectures, and this one I think this time we reach uh, an apex. <laughs> Um, Edouard is uh, originally from Brussels in Belgium, has studied in London at the AA and is a registered architect from the Catalan Order of uh, Architects. So also um, founder and director of a, a studio based in Barcelona, which is named Appareil, and that was created in 2011. And that does, let's say, more classical or traditional um, projects somehow, but there is also the other aspect which I think is totally uh, connected and, and undifferentiated from uh, what you, you do, which is the pedagogical um, approach and the teaching and the workshops which are uh, um, fully integrated in, in your practice. And so Edouard is currently teaching at IAC in Barcelona, um, but is, has been teaching at the AA for several years and is uh, still uh, directing the AA school in Barcelona and has also been a um, member of the EPFL and coordinating um, the first year project which uh, was uh, called ALICE and I'm stressing all of this because out of every workshop comes uh, uh, a project that eludes uh, any possible uh, expectation of what you would think a architectural workshop would uh, generate, so uh, the EPFL project was a one-to-one -one scale uh, prototype named House One that was actually floating, I think. No. Was it? No, it was not, but uh, next time it will. Next time. <laughs> uh, built in wood um, by all of the uh, first-year students. He also directed a workshop with Michel Gondry, the infamous filmmaker, that generated a, um, a project that was named des vivants, which I think is filthy and alive. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think you will tell us about uh, your experimentations with drawing and with uh, automated drawing, uh, because you have a strong interest and in literacy in uh, coding and automation. And, uh, well, not to expand too much on what has already been said, but the, I think, interesting um, aspect of the work is that it bridges data collection, data visualization, automation with a much more abstract and almost poetic uh, level. So with this, I give you the floor and join me in welcoming the work of it tonight. Merci. Something fun is happening. Let's see. Yeah, the slide is, is duplicated. There is a small version of the slide inside, the, <laughs> which is quite nice. It's <laughs> um, Thanks a lot for the for the invitation. It's it's really a pleasure to uh, to be here. Pleasure to uh, to be in Vienna for me. It's the first time and. Uh, um, it's a great, uh, it's a great chance. I'm very happy. Um, I'm going to give a, a lecture, which is going to combine um, the work of, of is going to, is going to, I'm going to combine different projects. Some projects are coming from the professional environment in my office that is called Appareil in, uh, in Barcelona. Uh, also an office that is called Cloud9, where I, I worked for many years uh, after university. And then also a lot of academic projects. So I'm going to mix professional work with, with academic work. And a lot of the academic work comes from the IAC, the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia in, in Barcelona. Also the Ecole Speciale in Paris, where I used to be, uh, used to be a professor some years ago. Then the EPFL in, in, uh, in Lausanne. Uh, and then finally also some, some uh, pieces of work from, uh, from the AA, um, additionally. Um, 
I'm, I'm running since, uh, since a few years something that I called machining protocols. Um, machining protocols, I think, it's, uh, I think it's a research line. It's a kind of title that I like to give to, to projects or to experiment, to exercise. Many of them are, are rooted at YAC. Uh, and some of them are also also connected to the office. Um, what what interests me in these uh, in these in these two words? Well, first uh, the word protocol, which can sound like a very dry word. Uh, um, I remember building site protocols, which are uh, basically the rules that tell you everything that you're not supposed to do on a on a building site. Um, but I think that the, the word protocol is interesting because, uh, the, because of the very nature of our profession. As architects, we, we don't work alone. We envisage, we project, we imagine um, projects that are going to need the involvement of a much broader group of people. Therefore, we have a certain responsibility of communicating, communication. We need to provide, uh, we need to provide orders we need to, therefore, we need somehow to define rules. And I think this is something that is valid um, in the making of a, of a project and its construction, but also in the creative process. So the fact of inventing our own rules, our own logics in a design process, um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's something that we're confronted to on a daily basis in our work. The word machinic refers, um, of course, to the word machine, which opens the door of technology. Um, not necessarily new technology, uh, I'm going to talk quite a bit about that, but technology in the sense of, uh, of the tools that we use. Um, for the sake of construction and for the sake of design, we use tools. Um, and there is, a, there is, maybe even today with, a, with, a, with the development of new technologies, our range of, a, of tools has grown. I think as an architect, we can be using many different types of a, um, of tools or of, um, or of machine and um, I think it's interesting to, to, uh, to try to use them in, in different ways and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to try to explain that in a, in a moment with some, uh, with some projects. Um, <laughs> it's very funny the effect, huh? Um, I'm not sure why it is. Let me see if... Yeah, yeah, it happens, <laughs> it's going to be horrible. Uh, in, in, in my work, but also in my teaching. It's a, it's a word that I, use, that I use a lot. I think, uh, I think the word quantity is a, it's, um, it's a very beautiful one and a very useful one in, in, in the way that we work. But I cannot dissociate it from the word quality. Uh, and I think that both of these, they might appear to be contradictive, but I think they work hand in hand, and I think they are very useful complement one to another. I remember that as a child, I used to understand the word uh, quality as something that differentiates bad from good, something that works from something that doesn't work. And then the more I, I, I went to, to school, to university, and the more I developed projects, I, I, I understood that quality 
um, eventually is very far from that and it, and it really refers to the specificity of, a, of an object. You know, there's so many ways to talk about, about quality. Um, but if you think of our role as an architect, as someone who uh, maybe draws, maybe invents, but then needs to rely on other people in order to get these things to be expressed or to be built in the most conventional sense, uh, then the word quantity is extremely useful. So I like to ask my students to try to describe a quality in terms of quantity. How can you explain uh, a quality with numbers, for example? It's a very difficult question, but it's a very nice one because it lets you look at things, I think, into a lot of, uh, into a lot of detail. Um, and I think this, this uh, concept or the relationship between these two words in, in the projects that I'm going to show um, comes quite often. And when I was preparing, I, I, I thought I would add these two words also here, um, intention and, and instruction, which I think also are, uh, in my mind, at least very, very strongly connected to, to the, the qualitative and the quantitative. Um, intention is something that we need as architects. You know, we need to have ideas, we need to have desires, we need to have uh, convictions which uh, are going to come into the design process, um, which are going to animate our, our self, you know, our person as a, as a designer, sometimes also, uh, also a, a team. Uh, potentially. But then eventually, let's not forget that this needs to be communicated. So this needs, these intentions, at some point they need to be translated into something that are, um, that are instructions. This is when the drawing, for example, one of our most uh, interesting tools or important tools, is what lets me transform an intention into an instruction for someone else to develop. Um, so. Um, some projects that, that illustrate this. This is a workshop that I did a few years ago, uh, as Emmanuel mentioned, with a, with a film director. I don't know those of you who, who might know Michel Gondry. He's a French uh, film director um, who has done films that are always in reality, but, but also very, they, they have a very strong um, surrealist sense. Uh, also, and, and what I like a lot about the work of, of Michel is that he works a lot with effects, uh, especially on, on, on space, uh, because he talks a lot about, or his movies are a lot about dreams and about maybe parallel realities. Um, but he doesn't refer to the computer, so he tries to look at effects uh, that he can do in, in, in the space that we inhabit in order to create situations that we maybe we're not, we're not used to. Um, and, uh, of course, he uses a lot uh, technology, but sometimes very basic te technology, not necessarily very advanced one, uh, to create these effects. And, and I thought it was very interesting to confront the world, our world, the world of architecture, to the world of a filmmaker. Um, so I invited uh, Michel to come and, uh, and, and do a collaboration at YAC. Uh, where suddenly Michel was transplanted into a school of architecture and where suddenly the architecture students were confronted to a brief that was more related to cinema than to, uh, um, than to the creation of a, of, a, of a piece of architecture. And um, what did we do? I'm still not too sure. Uh, I'm going to show it now and maybe you guys can have your own idea about what we did. Um, but maybe the, 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 the kind of basis of the brief was to uh, Michel really wanted to use these machines for what they were not designed. So if we would come now and we would show this film to the, to the engineers that conceived, for example, the, the, this robotic arm here, he would probably think, never I would have ever imagined someone would do something like this with this tool I made. Um, and, uh, and, and this is going to be a theme that is going to be recursive in the, in the, um, in the presentation. So here's the, here's the film. What we did is we took very small movies within the city, and then, um, do we have sound? Do we have any sound? Sorry, I should have said before. Um, so, so what these are, it's, it's a, uh, um, films of five seconds that the students did within the city of Barcelona. Um, and then um, they were looking within these short films that they did into uh, depicting a quality, some of the qualities of the film. Um, and then afterwards addressing the, 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 these kind of robotic means that we have in school, which are actually not uh, incredibly sophisticated. Uh, some worked with laser cutters, maybe I'll play, I'll play it again. 
um, laser cutters, CNC machines. Um, what the students were doing is they were reconstructing the images. So they would, they would um, export every image from these very short five second films that they did, uh, extract the image and then transform it into a, into a file that would be uh, read by the computer uh, in order to give an order to the, to the machine to manufacture different sort of materials. This is laser cutting on sugar, for example, that gave caramel. Probably this is, the, uh, this is probably not done so often. Uh, this is a milling machine that mills through a piece of foam and then some strong light that comes behind. This is uh, some clay that is being attacked by a, by a nail. Um, and then afterwards, as you can see, this image were, were then photographed again together with, uh, with, uh, with Michel. And then they give this kind of short uh, little films where I think one, one of the things that happened besides the fact that we missed use the tools uh, is that one or several uh, very specific qualities uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the image that they had found of the first initial film comes through. Um, this is another project that is, that, is, uh, uh, that is going on at the moment actually. This is called, the, it's a program in, in Barcelona at IAC that is called the Open Thesis Fabrication Program. It's a project about which I'm going to talk very little, almost not, but I wanted to have it on the screen uh, because it addresses uh, new technologies. What we do in this program um, is printing with 100% um, natu uh, natural materials um, and in this case, it's, uh, it's clay. So this is a, uh, a piece of 3D printed clay. It's unbaked um, because we are looking at the energy ratio um, that, uh, that this technology means. And what we do with this is we try, because we have a lot of freedom with the act of 3D printing, um, we try to print uh, specific walls that deal with climate, uh, climatic performance and structural performance. So it's a program that has been running for, uh, for, uh, for a couple of years. This is a shot from last year where we worked with, um, with a cable robot. So a cable robot, essentially, it's a big cage that is made out of scaffolding. Um, and in the middle, it's maybe hard to see, but eight cables um, are suspended to this cage that is in the center where we've set up an extruder, which is essentially a big needle that, uh, that deposits uh, clay. So that's one of the, the tools that uh, we were using last year. Um, this is one of the drawings that the students do of, of one of the one of the walls that got printed, which is uh, uh, which is here. So this is a largely hollow um, wall where the pattern is actually defined by a desire to, to self shade the wall for the climatic performance, um, and then another version, another project uh, within this program that we did last year in a, in a, in a construction fair is a wall that is uh, six meters long. We're actually trying to test the, the, the scale of, uh, of this technology. But um, I'm not going to get too much into this. Um, I, I, I wanted to show that because um, maybe personally it's the most advanced project I'm working on when it comes to new technology and when it comes to robotics. Um, the relationship to the tool here remains something that is fairly linear. Um, we've got fairly sophisticated tools in order to design, where we work with complex softwares that can analyze, that can generate, etc. Um, that enables us to make a 3D model, which then eventually serves as the information for a robot to activate this, uh, this needle, the extruder, that deposits the clay. So the, the, the relationship between the design or, or, or between the designer, let's say, and the machine is, is fairly linear, right? I do something, I write an order, and then I give, um, I give it to the machine that, that produces. Maybe quite old-fashioned in a certain way. No? We can imagine that industrial times were working in a similar ma manner, the use of a machine. Um, Yesterday I was, uh, I was in, in, in town, so I got to go to the, um, uh, to the Applied Arts Museum where I, found this, uh, I saw this installation from Robot Lab, which, uh, which is very beautiful. If you haven't been, I really recommend after your exams that you go and have a look. Um, what this does is, it's, uh, again, it's a very sophisticated uh, robot which um, draws an image that it receives from Mars. And it draws it with a pen that is extremely fine uh, so actually, in order to complete this very large uh, drawing, which maybe here you don't realize, but it's about, I think, eight meters wide, 
uh, it needs four months. So in four months, this robot can create this image. And I find it a very poetic and, 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 and questioning piece of work. Um, very nice. But personally, I have this same interrogation. Here, I, the, the, the use of the tool, um, it's, uh, in, in this case, the robot, is something that is quite linear. There is an image uh, that then serves as the, as, the, um, as the information for the robot to move along this white canvas and to draw whatever information it, ha it, has, already, it has already received. Um, this is something that I'm exploring somehow in, 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 in my work in, in design, in, in architectural design, but also in, a, uh, also in many little experiments that I'm going to show you now. There is, a, there is a, um, an artist, or actually a dancer or scenographer, called, um, called John Cage, uh, which I'm sure you'll come, if you haven't, you'll come across if you haven't done so. Um, he said something that, I, that for me is, is very important in the work, is that when, when um, in his opinion, when an artist starts a piece of work, um, he should not know the final form of that piece. Uh, and I think it's something that we can apply to our work. I, I don't think that architecture is something, an architectural project is not something that comes into your mind uh, when you begin the work and then, and then that's it. It needs to go through a development. So when you start working often, you don't know what you're going to end up with at the end. And this is something that I, that I try to, to, uh, to create a relationship to technology. So this is a very small project. It's just a couple of slides. Um, it's, a, um, an, it, it's a journalist that had asked me a couple of years ago to give um, my definition of what I believe contemporary architecture to be. And uh, well, I transformed the question because I thought it was too difficult. So I transformed it to what technology is today. Um, and this is a time where in Finland, uh, I remember bumping into an article, uh, an article in, the, in, the, in the Guardian, which says this, Finland is one of the countries to stop making cursive handwriting classes compulsory. Uh, so since a couple of years in Finland, schools have the freedom not to get kids to learn how to handwrite, which I, th I find highly... Um, um, uh, destabilizing somehow. Um, maybe you guys, I don't know if you will go through that or not, but for many years in architecture school, we've always gone through the debate of should we draw by hand or should we draw by computer, uh, which we've talked about so often. Uh, it has divided schools, it has uh, divided offices and so on. It's a, it's a very funny question, but it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's, a, it's a difficult one. And, and, uh, and, and what happens now in Finland, I, I don't know if it's a good thing or not. Some people are, are going to argue that yes, other people argue that no. Personally, I think that the more tools we know, the more we can, be, uh, we can, we can, um, we can express and, and, uh, and research our ideas. And then I, I, I did this small thing, because at this time, um, I have a nephew in Brussels who was seven years old and who was precisely writing, learning how to write. You know? and, and it's very nice to watch kids doing handwriting because they are so, uh, they are so yeah, clumsy. <laughs> They're so clumsy that it becomes nice, no? And it becomes exciting, and you remember when you were doing this your age. So what we did is we did a little, um, a little uh, installation between the two, where Gilles, uh, my seven-year-old nephew, is, is, is writing this title of The Guardian that I gave to him, and at the same time he's being scanned, and in Barcelona with a six-axis robot, which is a robot that is 20 times bigger than him, it can reach six meters away, um, is writing, uh, exactly with his run, handwriting on a, on, a, on a piece of paper. Now, this still, I think, is a linear process between the, 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 um, uh, maybe the designer and the, and the outcome, um, but it starts to, to, uh, to raise, I think, certain questions. Uh, at, least, at least I hope it does. Ah, it's this one. So should I leave it? Hmm? Yeah. It's a very thin sound, but it's a very nice one. Yeah. Good. Uh, 
Um, this is a this is an exercise that I that I was doing a yak with uh, with students where um, I would ask them to identify something that moves in their in their daily life and um, and to draw it or to let it draw itself somehow. So these students find a nice thing and they went to the beach. So um, these are these are four drawings of the sea. What they did is they um, they worked with a, with a little sensor that they constructed themselves. Maybe a lot of you will be familiar with what Arduino is, a little micro open source microchip, um, which in this case they worked with a sensor that ha that understands horizontality. So they did a little um, floating device, and then this floating device on the wave would be affected by the movement of the wave and would deviate slightly from the horizontal plane and activate a motor which was stressing this, uh, this pendulum. And then the length of the pendulum changes throughout the, throughout the time because it rotates on itself and this thing gets smaller. So these are four drawings of the, um, of the sea, I would say, or of the waves. And this is the, the, the drawing from Close Up, which I really like because it's um, not just because it looks like hair, but because it, uh, it has, you can, you can really feel time and you can feel obsession within this, uh, this drawing. Uh, And these are four drawings of, uh, of pigeons. And these are four metro lines or four trips in, uh, in Barcelona. Um, what I was saying about John Cage before, when he says that when you start a piece of, when he starts a piece of uh, a piece or a piece of art, you don't necessarily need to know the outcome. I think this is this is definitely something that happens here. I think there's clear intentions that are set by the by the by the designer, but then eventually the the, the outcome is highly unpredictable. And not only it's unpredictable, it's also unreproducible reproducible. So each of these pages somehow becomes unique. Now this one here um, raises uh, maybe another, it opens another little crack which is the one of, um, of, of the map I think because um, here there is such a strong logic between the movement of the metro and the movement of the ball on the page that you can, we, we were starting with these students to ask whether with one of these drawings they would be able to reproduce exactly the shape of the tunnel or the shape of the uh, the path that the metro um, has gone in, in time. So these drawings here, they start, I think, to maybe to address space in another way, and maybe they open this little window of a, of, um, of a drawing that can become a tool or that can become even an operative map. So with this, we went, we went and, and uh, like as a continuation, we did this piece of work in, for, uh, for a museum in Barcelona. Um, what we did here is we observed the... Uh, um, we worked on a public space in the, in the center of Barcelona, the Cathedral Square, for those of you that have uh, been there. And we looked at this, uh, um, at this square from a, a kind of plan, uh, a planner perspective, trying to get uh, a plan view on this. And 
the exhibition was uh, the exhibition lasted 14 days, and what we had in mind was to create a daily drawing, which would be a map of this public space, recording the position of the people and the time at which they had been occupying it. Um, so what we did is we invented this, so we, we didn't invent, but we used a, a kind of basic CNC uh, machine of which we replaced the mill by a, by a pen, and then we had this computer system which would get the information from the public space, transform it, interpret it, translate it in something Victorian that the computer could give as an order for this machine to draw. And what you have here is 14 drawings of um, uh, each drawing is a one-day drawing and, and, and this drawing, I won't get into the detailed explanation of them, but they combine, as I said before, the geographical position of the, of the users of the square, also together with this funny element that is on the right, which is essentially a, um, a clock. Um, the reason why the drawings at the top look different is that because we had bugs, so the first few days this thing was not running properly, so, and it's a funny thing because these drawings were on sale and the first five that were sold were the top five, the ones where there were mistakes. Um, but I find very interesting the, 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 bottom, the bottom ten because um, they are the drawings of the same space, same amount of time, same tool, same protocol, but then you can read the difference between them, no? This very small difference that makes that a public space or the space in general is never, um, is never equal at any two moments and the influence of time on, uh, on, on the space, which I think is something very important in architecture. So this was just a picture of the, of the, of the installation with the machine, uh, with the machine drawing. Then, um, a year later, we did a similar exercise with a, with a new group of students, but we decided to include electronics. Um, um, this is somehow the second fold of the exercise with these, with, uh, with these earlier machines that I, uh, that I showed you. So why did we include electronics? Because we were interested um, in being able to, uh, uh, to, give, to give orders to somehow bypass this relationship between in the first exercise, a force of nature that directly draws. We wanted to be able to have an influence within that. Uh, and potentially play with data. So there, there is still this, uh, this particularity in these drawings that they are impossible to reproduce. Whenever the experiment is being run again, despite the fact that now um, there is an Arduino attached there, you, can, you actually feed data into it, into it and if you, you feed two times the same data, it will still make a, a, a different drawing. So we're starting to, uh, to, to reach some interesting moment where, where technology is not doing exactly what we want it to do, it's doing something of its own. Um, and it, it somehow starts to question a little bit um, the, use of a, the use of a machine. These axonometric uh, or these isometric drawings that you see are also interesting, I find, because with the students, what we were trying to do there is to um, compare a machine to the, to the body itself. So the electric wires would be interpreted as veins, uh, the Arduino would be labeled as a, as a brain, um, the, the device that makes the pen move, which can be a fan or another thing, would be compared to the muscle uh, and so on. So there's, we were trying to blur a little bit this, this, uh, this question of um, what is the machine doing, what is the, what is the, um, the person or the designer doing. And um, I think it, it's, uh, th there is a nice thing about that is when you do a drawing like that, it becomes very unclear who did it. No? The question of the author completely somehow becomes irrelevant maybe. Uh, which is also an interesting question in the field of architecture. Um, it's, it's, is it the student that did the drawing or is it the machine that did the drawing? Or is it the teacher that asked the student that asked the machine? At the end, 
Um, at the end, this idea of the intention, this idea of the instruction, is something that here is, is a, um, it's very much being explored. I'm going to give a quick example of a building in Barcelona on which I had the chance to work some years ago. It's a building from a company called Cloud9, um, which is called the Media ICT. I'm not going to talk in great depth about this project, but I'm going to talk about it uh, when it comes to its environment, the situation in which it is, and its, um, and its climatic uh, purpose, I would say. So um, I, I think it's a fascinating project that, that one could talk about for a long time, and I invite you to go and have a look on, at it online if you're, if you're interested. I'm just going to talk about two climatic facades. Um, we're in Barcelona, uh, in Spain, with a very, with a very he heavy sun. Um, we need to protect from it. And, and uh, around the building, which is, I think, um, quite interesting in this project, every orientation, of course, has different requirements. Um, we're going to look for a moment at two facades. This is the southeast facade, the one with the triangular pattern, and the left one is the southwest uh, facade. The, the, the one on the right, the southeast, gets the sun from the, um, from, the, from the morning until roughly two or three in the afternoon. So it's a sun that at that point is not very, very, very hot yet um, and also has uh, a lot of trees and other buildings in front. Therefore, this facade is quite unpredictable. We don't know whether we want to block out the heat or we want to keep the, the, the light coming in. No, we are within this, uh, this, kind, of, um, this kind of dilemma. So we, we actually um, uh, came up with this system. We worked with a, with a membrane system, it's a material called ETFE, which is a very uh, thin Teflon-based uh, membrane that is under pressure. But what we did with it, as you can see on the top left, a section through the cushion, we have three layers. Um, and what happens with these three layers is that the inner, and the, the floating one and the, and the inner layer have these two patterns on it that are the, that are the opposite patterns. So um, it works a little bit like the diaphragm of a camera. Whenever we need to have light in, these two layers are being separated. Yeah? So these two patterns don't overlap and light can make its way to the cushion, uh, through the cushion. Whenever there is too much of a threat of heat, uh, these two layers um, come close to each other and therefore, when you overlap these two patterns, you get something that blocks out the light and therefore blocks out the, the, the heat. Um, what you see up there is a, is a, little, um, it's a little fan, actually, which is, uh, which is being uh, activated by, uh, by an Arduino platform. So the way that this system works is that every, every cushion is equipped with a, with a light sensor that understands actually not light, but watts, the quantity of watts that hits the cushion. Um, and that sensor, provides the information to a small Arduino uh, board which tells this blackboard on top whether it needs to blow air to the left or to the right and therefore fills up one cavity as you can see on the top left cushion one cavity or, two, or, the, or the other making this internal layer move either be on the, on the inner surface on the outer surface letting light through or, uh, or not. So I like to show that because maybe it's, it's quite a direct, I think, application of, of what these machines that we were trying to, uh, to do before, where, where, uh, where suddenly we try to embed a, um, a kind of a responsive system.
what what the, the students investigated here is the potential of, um, of uh, what, what we do is we do these projects where um, I give the students a very large amount of or very big public spaces in Barcelona where cars are, are somehow the, the ruling power. We take them out and then the students are confronted to a very big surface of public space which they need to activate or they need to treat. Um, so this is, a, this is an example where, where they speculated on the fact that trash doesn't necessarily need to be always uh, thrown out of the city, but actually if we try to treat it inside the city, it can also serve as a tool to organize, uh, to organize space. So they looked at how organic, space, uh, organic waste sorry, can be used, how uh, electronic waste can be used, how uh, synthetic waste could be used maybe for 3D printing, and see how these elements uh, can help actually in order to do the planification of a public space in time. Um, these projects are always difficult because I, I ask the students not to give the version of how the public space is after their design process. I ask them to, to think about 20 years of how this space gets defined. So we're never interested in one instant. We're interested in a kind of performative um, uh, model, how, how, how a space can continue to be alive or be designed while we actually don't know what is going to happen there in the future. Um, this, is, uh, this is a piece of work that, that, uh, that we were doing in Paris with, uh, with students at the Ecole Spéciale, where um, here we're touching cartography, again, where, where, where drawing is very important. And what I would ask the students is to go to some of the very classical parts, parks in, uh, in, in Paris, areas where, um, because of the French um, uh, landscape design, seem spaces that are very hierarchical and very defined. No? There is very often large amount of sur uh, areas of surface which are totally, seem to be totally homogeneous. Uh, so a place where apparently the conditions are the same everywhere. And what I would ask the student to do is to prove through an analysis, uh, a mapping analysis, and then through a drawing, uh, that this space is actually not the same everywhere and that there is maybe some uh, heterogeneous condition that, that animates it. So this, this student here decided to map stu uh, people that were walking through this, uh, this public space and then what she did is she, um, uh, she asked them for their age. So you, start, you can somehow recognize lines, this is the path of a person, um, but then the way that she represented is not as a line, but is, is a, um, it's actually as an energetical value. There is a relationship between our age and the amount of energy that our body emits. Actually, from, from, from that, if you look at life, from that point of view, it seems that 24 years old is the peak of our life. Uh, so we're out. <laughs> so there is a steep curve that goes up from, our, from the moment we're born and then it slowly goes, uh, goes down. So a 24-year-old person is a, is a body that emits, uh, that emits the most amount of energy. So this student, she decided to kind of question the conventional code of, uh, of representation and rather than to draw a line, she drew packets of, uh, of vectors um, that, would, that were kind of a, in, a, in a radial organization and that represents the amount of joule uh, that are emitted at this uh, at this location in the park. So, um, um, this essentially it's a map of the energy that is being emitted through time in uh, a public space in Paris. In this case, uh, no project was was done from this uh, from from this drawing. Uh, it's probably quite a difficult start, but I'm going to show another example uh, where where I worked when I worked with with diploma students. Um, I, I used a similar brief, but I would ask them to pick in, uh, in Europe an abandoned place, which they would have to go and visit. They would have to do analysis, do cartographical drawings, and then eventually propose um, a new function or a new way to inhabit uh, this abandoned place. And I'm just going to give one example, which is uh, of a cooling tower in, uh, in a city in Belgium, which is called Charleroi. Uh, this building is about to be demolished, or was about to be demolished. I trust now it's down. And then the students were speculating uh, on, on, on trying to find an appropriate program to make use of it. Now, their first, um, their first uh, reaction when they went there is that they were confronted to this very big surface, which for them seemed to be homogeneous. No, it seemed like anywhere around this surface was exactly the same condition, the same things were happening. But um, while they started to look at this in detail and they did several analysis, both on-site and off-site, they understood that by looking at different uh, aspects, uh, literally they looked at light, they looked at humidity, 
and they looked at ventilation, they realized that, um, that every different moment or point of this surface is actually having different conditions, which is something that might, they might be able to use in the design process. Um, this being a cooling tower, they decided to try to use uh, the force of, a, of, a, of wind, of ventilation, but also of, a, of light and humidity in order to see whether they could transform or they could use this chimney as a, as a foundation system for a village, kind of vertical village that will inhabit the, the, the surfaces of the chimney. So, um, uh, they drew it uh, first, um, then they had to find uh, we always work with something we call coordinate system. They have to understand how to locate themselves within these structures that can be very confusing in terms of geography. Um, here are the, the, the numbers. Then they did some simulation when it came to wind. Uh, and they were basically gathering all this, uh, all this data. They were gathering and then little by little they started to draw it. They worked with simple software that, enabled to trans that enables transforming the transformation of a value into a vectorial object. Um, and little by little, by overlapping these three maps of humidity, of, uh, of sun, and of, uh, and of wind, they came up with this map. So uh, this is an interesting document because it's eventually a flattened elevation of the, of the chimney. So it's a document which not only allows someone to uh, to locate himself in space, but it could also serve, it served also the student to actually construct models. They could print this, they could cut it out, and then from that they could reconstruct, um, uh, they could reconstruct their model. But I think more importantly, what we see is through the intensity of the, of the overlapping vectors, we see areas that are black and areas that are white, and we also don't see a clear transition between, between or a clear occupation of, of uh, so, so some of these things are unexpected. No? I was talking about the unexpected before. They had to go through this analysis to be able to visualize clearly where what happens. And um, the, the, the kind of combination or the sum of these three maps enabled them to give um, information that they could relate to the size, to the proportion of a, of a living unit. I'm not going to get too much into that, but yeah, so what, what they were proving is that this thing that appar apparently is totally homogeneous is eventually very differentiated. And then this is the information that they were able to feed into a parametric model that would interpret the size of a living unit, that would deform or modify the, the, the size of a living unit so that it, 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 um, it can capture light in a different way, it can deal with natural ventilation in a different way. So here is some of the, uh, uh, some drawings of the, of the outcome. And here you can see we don't have an image, unfortunately, of the, of the, of the model completed. Um, but you can see on the left how this kind of a, uh, almost like a honeycomb, uh, this, this, uh, this array of, uh, of, of li living unit comes and inhabit. But what is mainly interesting for me here is the fact that each of them having a, dim a different dimension is informed by the map that, um, that we have seen before. And this is also a project that we did at, at Ecole Speciale where we looked at actually a Gothic cathedral. So in this idea of the abandoned building, this is not an abandoned building, but it's an incompleted one, uh, although it's been incompleted for a few centuries by now. But we were, I was asking the students to actually think of a future or reactivate somehow a building site in, uh, in, uh, in, in Beauvais in the north of Paris. Uh, so they did these amazing models. Um, but essentially also the... the, the um, what I think was very interesting is the way that they started to draw these churches. Because if you think of Gothic cathedrals, they were, they were being made at a time where the meter was not available. Uh, the, the act of measuring and the act of giving these instructions of units and, 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 and scales were very different. So very often the measuring unit would have been a rope, a uh, dimension that is being conveyed by a rope. And actually what I asked the students to do is to measure this, this, uh, this cathedral without using metric information. So they had to relate dimensions that they would find the ca in the cathedral one to another. That's how some of these drawings come up. This is the drawing of one of the windows in the front facade uh, where you can see on the right that everything is a module uh, of another. No? There is this kind of fractal organization of small circles that fits into a, into a large circle that enabled um, the student, I think, to, to to draw this complex drawing, but also probably to understand how eventually it was conceived, uh, conceived uh, many centuries ago. And then this is another drawing of a, of, a, of a column. If you look at 
uh, a column in a Gothic cathedral, it's always very beautiful because it's a kind of witness of what happens above. You know? All of the lines of the vaults that are taking the loads from the top of the cathedral go eventually down into the column, and column in a Gothic cathedrals are really circular. They normally are um, very, um, very curved, a little bit as the trunk of a tree, and this is actually the, the very logic consequence of what happens above. So, um, I'm going to jump actually into, into a project that we were doing in the office. It's a, it's a competition entry where, um, um, where somehow looking at, at, a, at, a, at a historical reference and, and looking at it from a point of view um, that maybe can be quite technical or at least in this case organizational when it comes to, to material can also open up a design process. So we were looking at these lines, we were looking at the columns, and we were, um, we were proposing an intervention for, um, uh, for a temporary building. Mons, a city in the south of Belgium, was becoming capital of culture in 2015, and they needed a space to house um, or to host in public events, uh, street art, theater, um, theater and, 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 and other performances. So we, the, the site was directly next to saint rodrigue which is the cathedral there in Mons. Um, so we were wondering what we could do with, with uh, like somehow to evoke or, or maybe to reflect the, the, the presence of, the, of this uh, historical patrimony. Um, but we were wondering, like these are somehow incredible buildings uh, that work in, in mainly in compression. And we were wondering what if we would work with an element that works in tension, how could we, um, um, how could we revisit the, the Gothic vault uh, with, a new, uh, with a new material that works in the completely opposite manner. So actually we were bending tube, we were bending tube for, uh, for a while and, and we realized that uh, as a kind of form finding element, um, we could very easily, basically by, by constraining a set of points on the top of, of a of a vault such as this one, uh, we could dictate uh, a given form in a, in a fairly simple manner. So this model was actually done in, in, in no more than an hour, uh, and, and we discovered, which was nice, the, the relationship between model making and one-to-one -one construction. Now we understood that whatever we would learn into, the, into the, the making of these models, we could very easily somehow extrapolate to a construction uh, process. So these models on, on, on here at the beginning were um, somehow experimental uh, model. We didn't really know what we were going for yet. So this led us to, def to develop a, a kind of a parametric model where we would have inputs, which are these red lines, um, and then eventually by modifying these inputs, uh, see all of the types of geometries that we could create. So this here is, is, is for us a way to, it's a kind of catalog of the forms that comes out of a technology, and it was a way for us to, uh, uh, to create our tool set. Then here we address the, the site, um, and what we're playing here is the density of the, of the pipes. Um, this was going to be a, um, an open building, but we wanted these pipes, when they hit the ground, as you can see here, maybe to, to sometimes be porous and therefore be a navigable space, and sometimes to be so close to each other that they would create, uh, that they would create boundaries and therefore be able to separate program. Um, so here's a, a top view of the, of the, of the proposal, uh, where you've got several of these, uh, of these um, arched spaces that somehow um, overlap one with another. So the program was, maybe we see it better on the plan, uh, there's a stage on the top right, there's a cafe on the top left, an exhibition space, uh, a shop, and we were giving a lot of, of importance to all of this being one large open space, uh, as maybe we can see here in the, in the images, um, where, the, where the poles, where the structure hitting the ground would be actually the main organizational element for the for the distribution in plan. Um, this is a this is a um, a project that uh, that I did last year in Iran uh, with uh, in in a workshop in uh, in the Contemporary Association of Architects. Uh, there, where we worked with um, we worked with the star patterns. The, the I think. Workshops, when, when, when I get the chance to give a workshop elsewhere, there's going to be a couple of them, it's always a nice moment to, to, uh, to confront 
to uh, to another culture to confront to things that we actually uh, we actually don't know uh, and and this becomes so it becomes a kind of nice interaction with uh, with the students. Actually, students in this case brought a lot in. Uh, I think I might be the one that learned most out of this workshop uh, compared to the students. So what we did is is uh, is we analyzed um, we analyzed a lot of these star patterns, um, and we uh, and, and 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 we know that uh, Persian mathematicians uh, many centuries ago were, were, were extremely advanced. The geometrical uh, logics that, or the, the, the field of geometry um, mathematically was, was, uh, um, was one of their most important um, uh, field, scientific field. And uh, there, is this, uh, there is this interesting fact that um, uh, when it comes to star patterns back in, back in, in, the, in the Persian time, in mathematicians were more advanced than craftsmen. So in order, to, in order to, for the craftsmen to, uh, to create these, uh, these patterns that we've seen before, they were always relying on the, on the necessity to mass produce in a way, because these tiles uh, that they had had to be fabricated following templates. Therefore, they couldn't differ in shape. They could only work with four, five, six, up to 10, 12 different types of, uh, of tiles. And, uh, and arrange them in a in a, um, um, in in a, in, a, in a motif that would be prov provided. Mathematics went further than that, and and there started to uh, there are documents that prove the fact that mathematicians went already to the area of differentiation, understood that these patterns uh, could go further than how they were being manufactured. So we went a little bit into that, and we had to do um, somehow exercises into un un understanding what are the hidden uh, grids, the hidden lines that actually govern these uh, these organization or these patterns. And uh, by doing that, by drawing these, uh, here you see two sets of lines. You see these dashed gray lines and you see the, bla the, the blue lines. The dashed gray lines are, are, are lines that in an Islamic pattern don't appear. They're hidden lines. They are, uh, uh, they're invisible. They're organizational. They're eventually axes. They are lines that the, that the, um, that the the designer is using, that the constructor is using, but they are lines that then eventually disappear. They're not being materialized, so the, the, the viewer doesn't, uh, doesn't read them. But it's, it's actually an interesting exercise if you one day go to a, to a, to a country where you, where you see these, uh, these patterns to try to sketch them and to try, first of all, to ske sketch what you see and then afterwards to do the exercise of trying to understand where the organization lies within these patterns and to draw them again. And you'll see that you'll get actually much, much, much uh, better representations of them. Um, but anyway, what was interesting with these drawings when we were in Tehran is at some point one professor of, uh, of history came, uh, history of architecture came, and he recognized uh, on the left side of the drawing uh, a pattern that would be in a church in, Is in, a, sorry, in a mosque in Isfahan, um, for example, and then on the right of the drawing a, a mosque of, a, of, another, uh, of another location. So what was interesting for us is to understand that, that even though these two, uh, even even though this drawing has um, has the same organizational geometry underlying, eventually uh, different types of uh, of, uh, of star patterns could be uh, could be made from this. So we made these these drawings. This is a workshop that was called Delta Z, where we wanted to work a lot with geometry. Um, understand the power of differentiation of these patterns, but then also eventually try to take them away uh, or, or out of the plan and understand whether these, uh, um, these, uh, these geometries could also start to have structural role. So I'm missing a couple of uh, diagrams here, but this is one of the, one of the models that the students did uh, where they stretched this organization in space. Um, we were wondering whether well, a lot of people, uh, a lot of the, 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 the students and the people I was teaching with wanted to really call this a canopy or, or be able to really recognize a roof or an architectural feature in this. But I think this experiment is not about that. I think this experiment really is about understanding the potential to, um, to work with the grid in a three-dimensional manner and, and to see what kind, of, uh, what kind of geometry it can give. I think there's still a lot of work probably if one would want to transform this into actually into, a, into an actual space. But nevertheless, we did some tests and, and we went outside and we did a one-to-one uh, -one test where we were hanging this fabric and then, and then bending these pipes. Um, 
to see also what kind of specialities this, uh, this sort of system will give. Um, this is another workshop in Mexico. I think it's a couple of years before where, um, for those of you who have been to Mexico, you, 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 you know how much Mexicans uh, live, uh, work, and, and, uh, and, uh, um, and consider colors, which I always think in, uh, I don't know about you guys, but in the education that I received, uh, we never touched the field of colors. Well, it's such an important one. I think in, in I don't know if I generalize by saying this, but I think I would like to say that in Europe, we, we don't often treat color very well. And, and to have an experience in Mexico was interesting. Um, I had the chance to visit uh, some work from Barragan, uh, Luis Barragan, who's a very interesting um, Mexican architect who worked a lot with colors. And we hit this moment, I was visiting this with, a, with another Mexican architect where um, it was not actually here, it was in, in Barragan's house, but he has exactly the same combination of color where the, the, the floor is a kind of mustard yellow floor, a little bit, uh, a little bit 70s like, and then the wall that hits the carpet is a, is a fuchsia wall, incredibly strong uh, pink. And we had this nice moment where, where, where this person, this uh, Mexican architect, was kind of claiming that this was the, the, the most harmonious moment she had seen in the last, uh, in the last years. And I had a kind of stomach pain that I couldn't look at the mix of these two colors. I just found it completely odd and very strange. Um, and it was a nice moment where we realized that we just treat colors in a different way. So that's the theme that I brought to the workshop. We, I decided to, uh, to work with the students with these two colors and see how two colors can be, can be mixed. Um, there is a, a, like a nice fact about this workshop. It, it was in the University of Culiacan, which is a, sorry, the University of Sinaloa in the city of Culiacan, which is, which is very far away. So um, they had invited me to come and teach um, um, what did they say? I think they said something like parametric design, which is an expression I don't really like, but um, I was coming basically to teach uh, design with new technologies, uh, uh, when it comes to design, when it comes to making, etc. cetera. And, uh, and when I arrived there, I, I realized that there were very few means and the students were, um, were using, using uh, means that of, of designing that were not really enabling me in a few days to jump into something complex. And also they didn't have manufacturing, uh, manufacturing tools. So uh, I decided to work to do kind of uh, analog uh, parametric design. I, I tried to work, I thought it was an interesting moment to think about how can you by hand work uh, or in an analog manner work as if you are using advanced, uh, advanced technology. What does that mean? How can, uh, how can one do that? And um, what we did with, with, uh, with the students, we decided to, to build a gradient, to, uh, to, con to kind of question this, this line where the floor, the yellow of the floor meets the, the pink of the, of, the, of the wall, and to not treat this as a line, but to treat this as a gradient condition, where a wall that would go from pink to yellow uh, in, a, in a way that wouldn't make my stomach uh, too painful anymore. So the students were doing this. Uh, this is the classroom where we were uh, nicely exploring the mix between these two, uh, these two colors. And then I go back for a moment, but what the students came up with is a sheet of paper that would be pink on one side and yellow on the other side. And depending on how much you fold it, uh, one color appears or the other, right? If, it's, if the pink is in front, and you completely fold the page, then you only see the yellow um, and, and, and vice versa. So what you see here is, is kind of our parametric model, if you want, which are all the, all the, all the measurements at which this sheet can be, uh, can be, can be folded. Um, so um, this, is, this is then what we did. We did a very simple wooden structure with, uh, with fishing wire. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to say this whole thing fitted within 150 euros, um, <laughs> which, which means that it's very, very, very temporary, uh, especially with the paper. But um, I had this funny moment where I had been, I had traveled for very long, also it was, a, it was an effort for the university to make someone come from Europe and to teach, and, and there were all these kind of suspicious uh, people that were coming around to see what we were doing, what, what this guy that had come from Spain coming to teach con uh, modern technology or, or cutting edge technology was actually doing and the only thing the students were doing was folding paper. 
So there was a lot of skepticism. The, the director, who was actually a very nice person, he always backed me up, but there were some moments of a, of a bit insecurity. But, but then this, they, they, there was this very strange moment that happened where um, eventually there are 8,000 sheets of paper. And this is a workshop that we did in three days. Um, so it was, it was quick and, and, uh, and five or six hours before the moment we were supposed to, uh, to complete, uh, and we had a lot of people coming, we only had hanged a thousand sheets of paper. So we still needed to hang 7,000 and there was no way we were going to make it. We were going to make it. So we, we did, we, we kind of discussed with the 15 participants of the workshop. We said that from that moment on, they were not allowed to touch the paper or the structure anymore. The only thing that they could do is to go in the campus, find three people, three friends, ask them to come and work and actually give them orders. Uh, and themselves, the participants, they were not allowed to touch anything anymore. So very quickly, these little groups of four organized into a way that the, 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 um, the boss, I would say, the workshop participant, he had to provide data uh, because this gradient condition we wanted to do meant that every sheet had to be hanged at a specific location and had to be folded in a specific uh, manner. Otherwise, this, this notion of the pattern wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work. So the, the information that he had was X for the, the position on, along the length, Y for the position in the height, and then there were two folds, which was an X, and it had a value from 0 to uh, 14, and the bottom fold that was the Y had a, a value from 0 to 14 also. So the, the workshop participant, the, the boss, in between bracket, had three people to which he had to communicate these orders. So he would only say uh, A6, Y, 18, uh, uh, X2, uh, well, I'm getting confused now with the numbers, but, um, but what happened is that suddenly this kind of little building site uh, became in a rush, became a space where only numbers were being spoken. And it became a kind of singing, uh, a singing thing where nobody was saying anything else than A, Bs, X, Ys, and numerical values. And this was an interesting moment because this is a moment where actually visitors uh, would see their students working in a, the, 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 the visiting teachers would see their students working in a completely different manner that I do think somehow is a computational way to work. No, it, it doesn't take away the fact that the designer here has an intention, the, the, the desire to create this gradient, but then ever, everything afterwards is being regulated by logics, by rules, by a, certain, uh, by a certain protocol. And I find it interesting where suddenly you need to address these issues, but you may be not supported by the most advanced tools that we have, because I think it's an attitude towards uh, it's an attitude towards design. So here are a few shots of the of the uh, of the final piece, somehow. Um, yeah, we don't have another picture with no one inside, but it gives a feeling of the scale. Okay, um, uh, maybe I show one more project. How am I doing with time? Fine, yeah. yeah I mean, there are 14 projects, so let's do it. Okay, <laughs> that's good because there are another, there's another seven projects, so maybe I stop <laughs> after maybe I stop after this one. Um, this is the continuation of, a, of an exploration on, on this condition of the gradient. Uh, it's a competition we did for, uh, with the office for um, a building in Switzerland, which is supposed to house and to represent uh, Swiss wines. Um, um, so we worked with, uh, I'm, I'm going to be caught now into having to explain something that I don't fully understand, so that's going to be tricky. But we worked with, uh, with, um, with a lighting designer, um, a guy who studied physics, unlike, unlike me. Uh, and what, what, um, what, do, what does a bottle of wine share to a piece of art? Uh, they share the fact that they don't like light, right? Light is corrosive to, uh, to an art piece. Uh, same with wine. That's why we have wine cellars and that's why very good wines are being kept underground because the light uh, actually eats them or activates the, the, um, the fermentation. Um, so we, we were actually with these little bags uh, that we filled up with uh, more or less wine, um, we worked with this physician and we understood that by creating a kind of double facade, um, what this diagram is, is the spectrum of light. So it goes from infrared until, uh, until um, ultraviolet. And we understood that, uh, and this is where maybe where I'm getting it wrong, but the double facade would be able to take care of neutralizing the ultraviolets, the, um, uh, 
the glass was um, able to neutralize the infrared. And then what stays in the middle, in between here and here, it's all the other spectrum of light. No? So the blue, the, the orange, the green, the yellow, and the red. And, and, and um, what we understood is that all of these lights are corrosive to the wine, except for the, except for the red one. And magically, if you, if you use wine as a light filter, it takes away all the lights except for the red one. So we had a kind of nice, uh, um, a nice uh, conclusion here that meant that if you actually filter light with, uh, with wine, you get, uh, you get light that, that is not red, that appears as light, uh, and that is not corrosive for the, for, the, um, for the wine. So this was our kind of thesis in this, uh, in this project. Um, we, we could finally have a wine cellar outside of the ground with, uh, with natural light condition. So in parallel to, to doing this funny work with a, with a, with a lighting designer, um, we were also working on a structure. And, and what you see here is um, uh, it's actually the project without any skin. Uh, so it's, uh, what, what this, this, uh, the competition brief was for a fairly open space in which you could have events, presentation of, uh, of, uh, of wines, um, etc. So um, what you have here is a picture of a model where, um, uh, again, without the facades, where I'm trying to explain this big space there. Now, the idea is to, is to work with wine, to surround this building by wine, to protect uh, the bottles of wine that will be inside. Uh, of the space to make sure that they don't get damaged by the natural light. And that's where, um, uh, that's where we, 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 we had to go through light analysis. So these are two maps. Uh, these are plans, actually, of that space. No? So I don't know if you can see, but on the deep down into the space on the left, there is actually a service area that is for, uh, for storage, for toilets, for circulation, etc. You can see it here, right, on the light simulation on both of these maps. On the top right, there is this blue space, a space where light doesn't go. Um, but what these two maps show, on the left, this is a, a solar incidence map. So in other words, it's, a, it's, um, it's an analysis of the 365 days of the year of the amount of light, of lumens, that hit the floor uh, of our building without the facade. And then on the right, we have the conditions that we would need, that we would require for the wine not to get, not to get corroded. No? So um, what we didn't do is to design the facade and then see what it gives in terms of conditions. First, we set up, uh, again, what I call our, our intention. So we did this map and we said, this is the map that we need our facade to be able to create or to, uh, or to provide. So, um, eventually, you've got the wine on the, on the walls uh, acting as, the, acting as the, the light filter. And what you can see, um, I think the best is to see it on the elevation or maybe here. You can see that there is a gradient condition. No? A lot of the facade is dark red, but there is a certain part of the facade that is, uh, that is clear, which is because of this parametric tool that we used that was basically interpreting this map, this map that dictates the condition that the space needs to have inside, um, or that states the conditions that the building needs to have inside, dictates the, the, um, the, the gradient that the facade needs to, uh, need to have. So here I've got um, um, uh, an image of the model without the front facade, and then here when it is, uh, when it is, uh, when it is cladded. Um, Cool. So, yeah, I think uh, um, I think I'm going to leave it here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
know this, so there is there is an affectivity to the materiality in many mm. of the projects that you that you show. Can somehow be excited or, or uh, like uh, exposed by computational processes. And what I um, always wonder is. Maybe that's why I'm being a bit polemic. Sure, sure. So, but it's a kind of a, of a, of a almost like a sen seismographic or a kind of a sensing mm -hmm. way of treating uh, recordings and data. And in many, not at all in your, in your project, I didn't think, but in many cases, when then people begin to describe what these processes do, then it's somehow nature that speaks directly. It's somehow an order that is entirely natural, and we have catched it uh -huh. by these recordings. And with regard to the kind of sensibility I was talking about with Ungers, mm. <laughs> this is only half of the story, no? Because that's of course the apparatus is, and I think that's why you probably call your studio apparel. <laughs> the apparatus is, of course, they're conceived. Mm. So, but, but are they, uh, I'm a are they, uh, are they a kind of an um, idea, an imaginary, that go beyond being capable of sensing and not dominating? How are you, how are you thinking about this relation? That's a tough one. <laughs> it's a tough one. It's, it's actually the toughest one. And, yeah. uh, and it's, um, um, <laughs> And it's a question that always uh, that always comes in the in the juries that always comes in the in the conversation with the students, and and that's often where the projects don't work or where they or where they collapse. What what happens with this method of drawing is often the the material that gets created is extremely rich. Uh, very often it ends up being much richer than than the outcoming uh, than the outcoming project. Um, I I think it's often because. Uh, I'm not sure, but th there is the act of analyzing and the act of designing, which very often is being separated. You know, the, 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 there is the moment where I look and the moment when I, when I act. And there are many ways to look, there are many ways to analyze. And I think this is one way amongst, amongst so many. And actually, it's quite, a, it's quite a restrictive way because it blows out or it, it avoids to look at so many things to try to look at one thing um, very specifically. Um, and I, I get very often confronted to the fact that when an analysis is done, how do you actually start to, to, uh, to, uh, to design from that? Um, I, the, the most successful projects are always the ones where you cannot read where is this moment of, of hinge between whatever has been observed and whatever is, is starting to, 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 uh, to, to become designed. Actually, the act of mapping itself, uh, I think it's... it's uh, it's already an act of, uh, of design, and, and it's, uh, it's already, I mean, um, James Corner would say that it's already a political act. Uh, but but whatever, you, whatever you analyze, whatever you look at, you're, you're, you already start to make decisions towards how you're actually going to, uh, to interact and how you're going to start to design and how you're going to start to transform a, to transform a place. So, um, it's the recurrent question, and it's it's always uh, it's always very difficult to answer. Um, I don't have a clear methodology or a clear answer to 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 uh, in the process of projecting to to be able to make sure that it doesn't fail. And actually, I'm showing here the successful project or the ones that I believe I are successful or that I like at least. But there is uh, beyond them an array of of. Uh, of studies that, that, that didn't come through. So it's quite a risky project. And, um, and I think that that question that you ask probably is what, uh, is what animates me and, and the student that work with me most. Uh, and, we, and, we, and we look for that, but it makes it a very difficult question to answer. Maybe I will always look for the answer, actually. <laughs> Um, thank you. I think it was uh, really uh, nice and funny. I liked the one with the wine. Uh, I think my <laughs> wife will also like it uh, really much because she really likes wine. Uh, <laughs> she's from Chile. Uh, um, the, what, what I have uh, 
basically two questions. One is um, the, the facade with the smoke, um, uh -huh. the cloud facade, what kind of smoke uh, is it? And the second one was, um, which goes to the, also I think to the, to the, the point of the lecture series, um, if you know, um, how, what do you think, what should be the role of um, the architect and what should be the role of the algorithm in mm -hmm. how far, where should be the line in the designing of the, of the project, how far should, should it, uh, and what is the key, key task um, of, of uh, the, the architect? Yeah. Um, I start with the first one because it's easier. Um, uh, we use the nitrogen actually as the as the main agent for the for the smoke because smoke deposits other types of smoke deposit oil. We were in a closed environment, therefore we had to find. This was actually the biggest challenge into convincing everybody that we could do this this cloud was to was to find. We worked with a chemist, and we find this right uh, composition that led us to it. Um, so nitrogen. The, the second question is, is a crazy question. Um, um, as difficult as the, uh, as the, as the one before. In, I, I remember that I, I have a friend who's a, who's a writer, that's actually not super relevant, but I was telling him about the 3D printing project. Uh, so, um, and he was telling, and he gave me the, 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 the kind of quick assessment that by, by doing a 3D printed wall by a robot, we were, um, we were uh, going to kill jobs, no? which is, I think, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, and it's a very actual one, actually. The, 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 you'll find a lot of readings and a lot of skeptical uh, articles on this today. So, so but that's not my point of view, because I think in, in, in this project, we, we are not, uh, we are searching, we are investigating, and we're trying to find new solutions. We're not, we're not necessarily looking for a way to automate uh, something. I, I, I don't know if, if, uh, if construction needs to be uh, completely automated. It goes, in, it goes into that direction. Um, but actually, the human intervention is still, uh, is still extremely important, and, and, and automation doesn't always mean good. I think, it, in my opinion, it means good, because we're opening the spectrum of things that can be done. And, and, and for me, the, the, um, what I find fascinating in new technologies into the fact that we can work with algorithms um, is that today we are, with these tools, able to create things that we would not have been able to create without them. Um, as I was I quoted a couple of times, I didn't quote him, but I mentioned John Cage a couple of times. The, the, the fact of working within a domain where, um, where things are not determinated where, um, where we don't necessarily need to work with a top-down process, where one person has an idea and this idea is what needs to be executed, but where a designer can rely on external forces, which I believe we have always been doing, even before the computer was around, but can use external forces to reinforce his design, therefore to, to, to look at a variety of topics in his design process and to integrate them. And I think the computer, in my opinion, it's an interesting tool because it lets often, it gives you the power to, to compute. It, lets you the ca the, the, it gives you the power potentially to calculate um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that is more powerful that sometimes our brain uh, could do. Now, I don't think we need to put these two things in competition. I don't think that we need to put uh, the algorithm in competition to the, to, the, to the human brain. And I think that Whatever we do, whatever tool we use, eventually we will always need to have a judgment. No? Eventually you need at some point to stop the algorithm or, or at some point the algorithm, if it produces something, it needs to be still evaluated, it still needs to be uh, understood. And that's where the judgment comes in. But eventually, for me, my, my, my position is the, it's, it's the bigger our palette of, uh, of, uh, of medias, of mediums, the, um, uh, the better we can try to provide answers to design questions. What interests you? What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the very, very 
lecture, you have made, like, you've explored um, a big amount of really interesting stuff and it was really uh, amazing. Thank you, first of all. And I just wanted to ask, um, so you, you make these researches, actually, you make some kind of, like, not statistics, but, yeah, yeah researches, but... Um, do you have a way to apply it in real life? I mean, you've made some um, resources on in Barcelona. You just threw away all the cars and just how the um, like what the students what can do there. But are you looking for a way to um, apply it in real life or just for? interesting kind of research? I, I, for me, they are the same. I think there is no difference between research and, and, and normal life. I, I think the, the research that we do, I, eventually, we, we do, or, or I try always to look at things from a pragmatic point of view. I understand it doesn't always, might seem that way. Um, but I like, to, I, I like to think that there's no, there's no, that there's no difference. Between between research and the real world, I think it's I think it's it's the same thing. What what I try to do is is uh, I I realize that I'm, I'm I'm I always feel the need to invent something in in every project. There's always the need to escape somehow. Uh, I'm always really um, uh, reluctant to repeat something two times, whether it's a project or whether it's a it's an exercise or whether it's a it's a drawing. It always has to be. It always has to be to be new because I think otherwise I get bored. You know, I'm 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 somehow not happy. So I think that is what is is sometimes pushing me to 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 try to go maybe a couple of steps uh, further than than what I would no normally have done, and and that's what leads me into areas that maybe we call research. But I I don't think that I'm I'm animated by any. Um, I don't know. I, I, I like to think that everything that I've shown and everything that, I, that I've done are actually um, feasible answers for the, for the real world. I, I, at the moment, we, we're working on this 3D project in, in, in school. And um, we are today, we started the construction of a wall that is five meters high, uh, all out of, uh, out of mud, and actually out of sections of wall that are 10 millimeters, because the wall is is several layers, so there's a lot of, of, of air cavity within that, but it's a wall that not only it's totally recyclable, it's, it's actually what we do is we use the ground, we're building in a natural park, and we're using the ground of the natural park in order to build, so there is this, this kind of circular um, uh, desire in the project, and, um, and, 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 um, and then we are, we are, we are 3D printing. The, the possibility of 3D printing in this case, it's huge. No? The amount of formal freedom, well, it, it's not uh, unlimited because we are really constrained by, uh, by, structural, uh, print, by structural requirements and by climatic requirements. So eventually, this wall has a, a form that is actually almost totally planar, but it works incredibly specifically when it comes to the climate. Um, and uh, th this project is interesting because um, in, in, in parallel to prototyping, I had asked the students to, to give, they were working in groups of three and it's a program for nine students. They had to provide, um, in a, they had to do a project to create a passive habitat, uh, a housing project. So, um, and, and we gave a lot of, this technology is not at all mature. This technology is something that, um, that in, in Spain has no chance of being homologated in the construction code in the next few years. Also, we, we have been confronted to the, the concrete industry or the concrete lobby, let's say, which is difficult to, uh, to beat. But when it comes to building with this material, it's, it's science fiction because we need years until the government says this material is good enough for construction. But on the same time, the students were designing living solutions, understanding how uh, using 3D printing in construction can be profitable, what, what can be the good things about it, and working with a material that is 100% um, material that is, um, sorry, 100% natural, which therefore is a, it's, um, uh, it's a very good mix 
somehow these two things. So here, I think we, we like I'm kind of trapped because I know that tomorrow we won't do it. But I also know through the work that the students have been developing and the fact that we can prototype that this is a technology that is ready for construction and that can give, I think, very interesting building solutions for, uh, for, uh, for today, actually, not for tomorrow. Thank you. What do the students, when they apply to study at IAS, what, do they, what, what are they most curious to learn? What do they, how do they think about their education? What do they want you to teach them? Yeah. What, what do they imagine they're, they're going to be doing at But they don't think they're going to be drawing. So when I give my first assignment of doing some drawings, normally all of them look down and they don't want to do it. Um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting school, IAC, because it's, uh, it's, very heavily it's very strongly related to new means of, of design and manufacture. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's already in the, in the Latin world. No? So it's, uh, it's, uh, sometimes it can be quite a, an organic school where I think um, um, the protocols are maybe a little bit more loose than in, uh, than in other schools. I had the chance to teach in Switzerland uh, where, where I remember that to make it to the Robert room, you had to go through eight doors and each of these doors you had to, write the, you had to have the right card in order to be able to go through the corridor. So I never made it to the robot. And, uh, <laughs> and in the arc, I, I dropped by on a Saturday night at nine o'clock because I forgot something where I want to check. And then I see six students that are on top of the machine taking it apart because they want to fix something new. Uh, and maybe it breaks, but maybe it doesn't break. But if it breaks, someone else is going to fix it and it's going to be okay. And, uh, and the yak has this very nice attitude where um, where technology is not on the other side of a door. Technology is with us, uh, it's open source, it's totally hackable, um, and I think, for me, this is the great value of the school, and I think this is a lot what students seek. It's the fact that, uh, that it's there, no? The Fab Lab is there, we're in the Fab Lab. It's not that, um, that the architect does his drawing and then puts it in a box and then gives the box to the constructor and the constructor uh, builds. I'm sorry, now I realize this sounded very negative. Um, but the, 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 what, what we really try to do at the ARC is to, is to put the architect into the, into the shoe of, uh, of the constructor, in a way, to, to, to get him to make. And I think often the, the, um, all these uh, new tools that we, that we have available, I think it lets us as architects connect again to materials, connect to structure, connect to organization. And I think very interestingly, eventually, connects us back to craft. No? I think a lot of the, the digital tools, they let us look again at craft in a, in a very exciting manner. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.